Good afternoon. Welcome to Saturday Talk. My name is Nock Acker. Today we have Brett Herman speaking today from the Radford University on their photo research and educational outreach trip here to Barrow, Alaska. Thank you, Brett Herman, for everything. <laughs> Not a problem. All right, I wanted to tell you a little bit about ourselves. We've got a very diverse group up here. We've got, oddly enough, three high school students, although they're a little bit unusual. Megan Lacey, Andrew Vaccaro, Madonna Yoder. The high school students, uh, they're a little bit different because they go to the Southwest Virginia Governor's School of Science, Math, and Technology in the mornings, which means they get a heavy dose of science, math, and technology, which means that they have contributed mightily to the research on this trip. A couple of Bradford University students, Alec Frazier and Marcus Jesse, we drug them off to the polar regions up here. Marcus, we got a little bit late. We got Alec a little bit early, so who knows? We may be able to keep him going in something like this to keep him busy and off the streets. Uh, he needs it sometimes. He needs focus. It's okay. And Dan Blake, uh, who teaches not only at the Governor's School of Science, Math, and Technology, he also teaches with us at Radford University. He is all about the physics up, down, and sideways, plus all the technical stuff. He loves it. And uh, I'm here from Radford University, and we have another Radford University faculty member up here, Mithy Ann Shelton. She is a science educator in our department at Radford University. We also have, from the Radford University School of Teacher Education and Leadership, this is Brooke Meyer. She already has her undergraduate degrees in biology and chemistry. She did a compressed two-year program. She shoved two years into one year to get her master's in education so that she will be certified and have a master's in education all right, we wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're doing up here. We wanted to use geophysical methods to study the sea ice. The reason that we wanted to do that is, well, there's several reasons. One of the reasons is I got interested in studying the sea ice at the same time that I was uh, acquiring access at Radford University to a number of pieces of geophysics equipment. Those pieces of geophysics equipment, you know, I'm not a geophysicist, but I learned how to do the geophysics. It was uh, very interesting to me. And it turned out that I'd read that several pieces of this geophysics equipment were used for this kind of polar ice research. In particular, in the last several years, I've acquired more and more sophisticated ground penetrating radar equipment. A lot of what I use that for at Radford University is covert burials or overt burials. We uh, go to various cemeteries and tell people, you know, somebody is actually buried here. No, this stone over here is not marking anybody. There is nothing buried down there. However, over here in this area where you don't have anything marked, I can clearly see a burial down there. So you need to go back and check your records. We do that a lot in southwestern Virginia. It also turns out that I read that people use ground penetrating radar equipment to be able to study the sea ice. That is, you know, you've got to be careful about that because one piece of geophysical equipment may do very well in one environment but not necessarily in another. And This is one of the things that we are learning, maybe the hard way or whatever. So uh, we have that plus electrical resistivity. Electrical resistivity allows you to be able to create a CAT scan like image of the ground and it's all based on the electrical characteristics of the ground. And so you would see something like a solid boulder having a high resistivity, and you would have a, uh, you know, a bunch of water down under the ground with a low resistivity. We also have a couple of supplemental things, global positioning system to be able to locate our surveys, especially for the topography, however. That makes a tremendous difference, as you'll see with the GPR. The manual ice depth measurements, that's sticking a stick into a ground that was actually measured out to be able to see this, and of course that's snow depth instead of ice depth I see from the crowd. And the new thing that's here is this thermal data logger. The Southwest Virginia Governor's School crowd is going to tell you about that. With the ground penetrating radar, it's a very nice piece of equipment, relatively simplistic technology, although it's very hard engineering wise to make it. You send off a radar signal from one end of the equipment, this is the transmitter. It comes down, bounces off some sort of transition, whatever that transition is. If there is a boundary to bounce off of, this radar will bounce off of the boundary. It will come back up. The time that it takes the radar signal to go from the transmitter, hit the boundary, come back up, that tells you how deep the boundary was, it's just the time of flight. If you have several boundaries down here, then you have several reflected signals. The ground penetrating radar as you walk along shows you the location of these boundaries. 
This is a picture of our ground penetrating radar unit. It was nice and convenient because it happens to fit right here on the cart. Inconvenient in that we had to, as you know, to uh, insulate the control console, but that worked out very well. Since the ice was relatively flat where we were studying everything, it made it uh, very easy logistically to get all sorts of data. The only problem was if there are boundaries, and there is a big if sitting there. This is the punchline of something that we did over the course of several days. We have two different frequencies of radar antenna. One is at 500 megahertz, one is at 250 megahertz. I've read that both of those frequencies have been used for various studies of the sea ice and the ice, the snow ice boundary and the ice water boundary in the Arctic. And we were thinking, well, maybe we could do the same thing with ourselves. The only problem was this. It was very easy to go along, use the GPS information that we have and put this in context. What you see over here is, in this case, I think it's height above the mean sea level for the planet in this location. And so we started up here on the uh, ice that was over the ground, and you can see the various layers of the ground sitting right down here. We took the radar unit over a few little bumps and wiggles, and we started to work our way down onto the sea ice. The sea ice is this flattish area down through here. <laughs> One of the things is, you may say, hey, look, this is the boundary right here between the ice and the water. Uh, no. Darn. Um, the reason that I say that is uh, several fold. One of the reasons that I say that is that this extra place right down here follows the surface of the ice way too easily. That made me a little suspicious. So what I did was, we repeated these surveys several times. Each time I messed around with the data taking parameters. It turns out that over the same location, all of a sudden this line up here could easily get either shallower or deeper. Mm, no, I don't think so. In the course of three hours, I don't think the ice goes from one meter to uh, two meters thick to half a meter thick. It just doesn't work that way. It turns out that this is an artifact. We did this with both the 500 megahertz and the 250 megahertz antenna. I set it to take data 16 times at once to try to pull out anything good down there. Uh, the radar said no, didn't work out so well. So the ground penetrating radar after four days, we are quite confident that the ground penetrating radar is absolutely, totally and positively useless, at least the unit that we have for studying the sea ice right here. Darn. And so we thought, well, you know, there's another piece of equipment that we brought up, something that doesn't care about boundaries, it just cares about what's down there inside the subsurface. That one happens to be the OMAPR, the capacitive couple that coupled resistivity, and Marcus Jesse is going to tell you a little bit about that based on some pictures that he had that I doctored and added a few things to. So using electric resistivity, what we did was we wanted to get a decent image of the subsurface. The way this works is you've got the person right here, and then you've got a receiver, and then more receivers in our particular array, and then you've got a cable that separates the transmitter and the receiver. The way resistivity works is it basically measures how easily the electricity can go through the ground or the subsurface. So this is a picture of, it's sort of hard to tell when everybody's sort of dressed up, but somebody, and I think that's Dr. Herman, and this is the resistivity array. The way this works is a signal is put out of the transmitter, and it goes down at roughly 45 degrees. It comes in contact and measures the resistivity here, here, and here. As we drag this along, that point moves across the surface, so we get a measurement here going across the screen, here going across the screen, and here going across the screen. What we can do with that is we can model the subsurface and see what's actually there in areas like this. Now we can't really get an exact measurement, but we can get a relative understanding of what's going on. And here's our data points, and these are the points that show where we've collected data that represents what's going on underneath the ground. Do you want to explain that? This is the absolute, honest to goodness, completely raw, unprocessed data that comes out of the uh, resistivity. The horizontal component over here, the distance along the line from 40 to 260 meters on this one, 
from minus 20 to 220 meters on this one. The only thing that's relevant here is that these two are images of the same location. Again, these are absolutely, totally crude and rude approximations at the very beginning. These are raw data. Like Marcus said, by virtue of lengthening the rope between the transmitter and the receivers, we can look a little bit deeper. It took us several days to figure out that we were getting too greedy and we were trying to look too deep. We were losing signal. We thought it was a problem with the cold. It turns out not to be the problem with the cold. It turns out that we were trying to look too deep, trying to send the current through the ocean water, which is highly conductive. And so the current goes into the ocean water, sees the ocean water, and then goes off and scatters all over creation, and it does not come back up to the surface to be measured. Therefore, we got no signal, and for three and a half days, we got no signal, no signal, no signal, and then Friday we figured out, ah, we're looking too deep, so we moved a little shallow. These two things, this is five data depths, not quite so shallow, maybe this is about five meters down, ignore the numbers over here. This right here may be down to about six meters down, putting it all together when the rope is a little bit more lengthened. Features up here at the top do line up with features on this one because on the bottom one you are looking a little bit deeper. And so in general, you have a shape for a relatively thinner section of the ice here, lining up there, and you have relatively thicker ice over here on the right hand side, lining up with those two. If you process things just a little bit, it takes the raw data up here, this particular piece of software that does minimal processing right here, but the picture down here at the bottom is the punchline. So the picture at the bottom is the one you pay attention to. Highly resistive areas. Highly resistive areas are solid ice. It does not conduct electricity so well. And so you've got all of these you know, reddish and uh, orangish things over here. It doesn't necessarily mean that the ice is red or orange. It just means it doesn't conduct electricity very well. The stuff down here at the bottom, this is the seawater that we were sniffing into it. And over here, this is actually a fairly decent um, vertical depth scale. Taking those two things together, um, you can put together a color file which is a little bit more intuitive so that ice turns out to be blue and blue-white. There is a slush layer down there. You can't take this black line as indicative of how thick it is, but there is a slush layer down there, and then the water itself is the blue. Where the ice goes or appears to go off the bottom of the picture up here, ignore that. Again, you have to take this with the caution down here. All the results are model dependent. But the point of this will be used with the, the ther thermal data uh, a little bit later. This is an approximate shape of the bottom of the ice as you walk away from the seashore near Narl. A couple of meters thick over here, this is the uh, vertical scale over here on the left hand side, two to three meters thick of the sea ice somewhere in there. This is highly model dependent, which means I can make the output image look a little bit different. I can artificially raise or lower the apparent depth of the sea ice, which is why this caution down here, everything is model dependent. It also takes a long time to sit down, lock the door, and process this data over and over again to see what we've got and to see how, you know, maybe we can narrow this down. The reason that I was trying to use ground penetrating radar, you learn in geophysics, if you have one geophysical method, you really need to use two to indicate the same thing. If we would have had time in the budget, the ground truth, drilling through and finding where the bottom of the ice actually is, to lock it down and say, you know, I should have drawn this location up here. That's the ultimate goal of this. We did not have that for this particular trip, but we're working on it for future trips. The nice thing about this is that there may be a correlation with a really good idea to be able to at least measure something about the ice that, uh, I don't know, may be of use to someone else, and the governor's school crowd is going to talk about that. Okay, so we designed a cart, and Dan programmed the software for our um, thermal sensor, and uh, we call it Therma, and she is about two meters tall at the tallest, and it has a, um, two thermal sensors, as well as a mark button and an on-off switch. Um, this is our second version with uh, the pole for the GPS. 
originally we were using an LCD screen, but then we realized that that was not very useful since it could not be out in the cold. Um, this is me hooked up to the cart, and um, the mind and control board of the cart is inside my jacket. Uh, it's run by a small microcontroller, and it reads signals from uh, the infrared sensor and the thermistor, uh, which I will show in more depth on a later slide, and also from the GPS. It collects data at about 50 hertz, so our data files are extremely large. Uh, the infrared sensor uh, senses the uh, temperature at the surface of the ice, and it is under this cap, which we keep on to keep moisture off of it inside. So the thermistor measures the ambient temperature of the air, has proved really useful. The um, infrared sensor measures to um, hundredths of a degree centigrade. Uh, the GPS places a timestamp in the data, which is useful for determining which run is which in the data, and also records the latitude and longitude, so we can um, connect that with uh, the GPS run over the line. The mark button is used for when we pass a flag in the survey line, and um, shows us exactly how fast we're going. Uh, the on and off switch is used to reduce the amount of data in our files by keeping it off when we're not on a run. Um, the flags are at 10 meter intervals and um, the mark button has been very useful but it did break yesterday and we were able to replace it. The microcontroller is um, an Arduino Pro Mini and Dan made a program for it to um, collect all the data and moderate um, which sensors um, got power and how much. Uh, it reads all of the sensors and we put all of our data on a micro SD card. Uh, the battery also connects to the control box. We use 5 volt battery. Okay, so we um, designed and constructed Thermos cart out of half-inch PVC pipe uh, at the governor's school before we left, and um, we Marcus added a wooden pole for the GPS to be on, and uh, Dan helped a lot with that. And then before we shipped it to Barrow, we disassembled it and put it in boxes and shipped it. And when we got here, we had to reassemble it um, and then we bought Gloop and glued the PVC together. And then we laid out a survey line of 160 meters and uh, we put flags in the ground every 10 meters so we could use that to mark whenever we went by them. And uh, then Marcus used a GPS to measure the line so it would be exact. Uh, the first day we made several just kind of tests to make sure everything was working. Um, this is us going out to the ice on the first day. And then the second day, uh, we kind of started everything that uh, we were here for. We began to take exact measurements and write everything down and uh, you know, developed a method that we knew worked correctly. Um, that day, we made 12 more runs on the 160-meter line. Um, on day two, uh, everything fell apart that wasn't glued. It caught on all of the ice. So we had to drill holes into them and put zip tie through them. Um, and then we put the uh, zip tie the GPS pole to because it fell out. Uh, on day three, uh, a wire that connected to the sensor snapped because it's so cold outside. So Dan had to replace the entire sensor. And then we added a toggle switch so we could uh, turn the data flow on and off. And then we in insulated it on because it was so cold outside. Um, on Thursday, we were able to do a lot of runs that produced uh, fairly good data. Uh, we did six runs on the 160-meter line, and then we extended the line to 290 meters, and Marcus measured it with the GPS again. 
and we made two runs on the 290 meter line, and then four runs on a 240 line, because uh, the 290 meter line had, uh, the terrain was way too rough for us to get through. Um, we were about four hours on the ice that day, so it was pretty long, but um, it worked out well. And then yesterday was our last day, and we made six runs on the 240 meter line, and then um, during the run, the mark button fell off, so we tried to put it back in, but it fell out again, so uh, we weren't able to get most of the marks in on the last run, um, but it's been replaced now, so. Hello. That's really loud. Um, so after we get the data from the SD card, uh, there's a little um, guy on the microcontroller that writes it to an SD card in a text file. We go ahead and import that into Excel. And when we press the mark button, little stars get inserted into the data. And what we do is we use an if statement in Excel so that when, once we go to graph it, it'll have lines where those marks are placed. We use the GPS timestamp to help determine uh, which line is which. So when we're out there on the ice, we'll write down one, run one started at 11 o'clock then we can go back in the data and say, okay, this mark was at 11 o'clock. That's probably the start of the run. Um, as you'll see in a second, the uh, Excel file does have several uh, data columns on it. There's a time column for displaying how long, oops, sorry, hit that. It shows how long the microcontroller has been on. That is also useful as a backup in case the GPS is not taking data. And then the infrared and ambient columns show the temperatures of the ice and the uh, ambience, respectively. And then the latitude, longitude, and then there's some time columns over to the right, and that is the uh, GPS data. So you'll see up, oops, okay, that's the, so you'll see up here, these are the marks, and these stars are what we're using. Every time we pass a flag on the line, we will press the button, and that'll usually insert about five to six stars in the data. This is in microseconds, so as you can see, it's maybe about 18, uh, sorry, milliseconds, 18 milliseconds between marks, so we're taking data very quickly. This is the infrared temperature of the ice in degrees Celsius, and then this is the ambient temperature. So for this day, the ambient was a little bit colder than the ice. And then over here, you'll see that this is the GPS data uh, with latitude, longitude, and then the uh, time at which the data was recorded. So after we import that to Excel, we graph it. Um, I'll show you the graph in a second, but both the ice and the ambient temperatures are graphed against time. The blue lines are showing the ice temperature of the, the surface of the ice. Red lines are showing the ambient air temperature. And then inside each of those larger lines, we have a small black line, which is the uh, running average. And then you'll see some vertical lines at the top which show where we marked for the flags. So this is uh, a run in the morning of Thursday, I believe. This is going from the shore out. So up here are the marks. Uh, we probably missed one right here, which is why there's such a large gap. So the, this blue line right here is the uh, exact measurement that the infrared sensor gave us. And then the black line is a running average in between that. So we're more likely to trust this uh, black line when we're actually examining the data. Down here is the ambient. As you can see, it's much more stable because the ambient should be more stable. And there's also a uh, running average in there. So the main point of taking this thermal data is we are trying to correlate that with the thickness of the ice. Our basic idea is that thinner ice is closer to the water. So the water is acting as a heat reservoir because the water is much, much warmer than the air above it. So heat waves are traveling from the water to the surface of the ice. The thinner ice should be warmer because the water is closer to the surface. Um, right now, we're getting some preliminary uh, correlation. It's not very strong, but we are seeing some indication that our hypothesis could be correct. So this is the map of the resistivity. This one does not have the uh, ice coloring in it, but most likely the, this, the bottom one is the uh, calculated 
resistivity one. So most likely the surface of the ice is roughly about here. Uh, over here is much thicker ice because it's a higher resistivity. And then over here is probably a uh, thinner area. This over here might even be the ground, depending on where we started. And then these are the two side by side. So as you can see, as we're moving out, it's very warm up here comparatively. It's about one degree Celsius warmer. And then as we're moving out, the ice is getting thicker up here. It's going from this yellow lower resistivity to the high. Notice right about here, it drops a lot. That is probably this area right here where it's very thick ice. And then it drops again over here, which corresponds with this area. So right now, it does seem that there is some correlation. Um, the real question is whether that correlation can be used to measure the ice and give a approximation of how thick it is. Uh, we're going to have to take a lot more data to get to that conclusion though. So right now it's just very rough, but there does seem to be some sort of correlation. Whether or not it is precise enough to uh, aid with measurement is still to be decided. And we would just like to thank Barrow for having us up here. My name is uh, Mindy Ann Shelton and this is Brooke Myers with me. Uh, we probably had the most exciting, I think, job while we were up here. Uh, we're both uh, educators. I taught middle school and high school for a total of 16 years before coming and working at Radford. Uh, and Brooke is a student teacher. So what I wanted to do, I came two years ago with Rhett and the other students. Uh, and being a graduate of Radford the, at the elementary program, we didn't have any research background. Uh, I knew how to teach and so forth, but as far as research, no. So I wanted to come and experience the research. But being an educator, I also wanted to share it with students. Uh, because where we're from, they typically you might see snow, but an area like Barrow, no. And so I wanted to make them aware of research, what's going on, and also to share a little bit about what life was like here. And so when I came back the second time, I wanted to bring a pre-service teacher with me from Radford so that they could experience research uh, and to see what it was like. Uh, because once you experience it, it, it just it makes it so much uh, easier and it's different in how you explain it to children because you've had that experience. Uh, the second one was looking at K-12 through students, allowing them to see Alaska because a lot of them, they've never been and most of them will probably not get to come at least this far north. So for them, this was the first experience they've ever had. Uh, and also, it, it's for all of them, uh, but for a lot of them, I want them to see science in action. They're used to doing experiments and small activities in the classroom, but to actually see scientists gathering data, and even like with the governor's school children, to see them gathering the data, to make them think about, hmm, maybe I might want to go to college somewhere. Maybe this is something I would like to do. Uh, and also along the way to share with them a little about the culture that is here because our kids want to know what it's like here. They in particular want to know about the people and the children that are here. So, and to let you know where we're, where we're at, um, and the reason I include the map, when I first came up here, my kindergarten children, they thought I was going somewhere warm. And the reason they thought that was because on most maps, they put Alaska and Hawaii down here by Texas. And that's where that came from for kindergarten children. And so I may always make an effort of them knowing where we're going. Uh, and for you that are here, we are from this region of Virginia, Henry County, uh, Bedford, Franklin, this region right in here is where we're from and where our students are from. It's a very rural area. Um, you know, we do have snow in the winter time, but you know, we see the four seasons there. Okay, so we Skyped really early in the morning to be on East Coast time. So that's, we started about 3.15 when we wake up and then start around four, um, so we could at least sem be semi-awake to talk to them. Uh, we talked to about 550 students between the two of us. Um, and that's just once, it was multiple, multiple Yeah, times. so I talked to, I'm student teaching in a 10th grade biology class. I talked to them uh, almost every day. So every period that I teach, almost every day. And we would talk 
anywhere from 15 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on what was going on in class that day. Uh, of course, we can't take up all day to talk to them because some other learning needs to take place for standardized testing. And I talked to a private school as well as public school. Thank you. Uh, this is Brooke Skyping with her cooperating teacher, Mr. Brown. Uh, obviously, as you can tell, it was early in the morning. Uh, and what we would do is take the laptops out so that they could see what it was like outside morning, afternoon. Uh, and this is just one example. This is like right outside of our hut. Okay, so some other things we did besides Skyping. Um, the Governor's School students and myself uh, blogged and the days that I didn't uh, get to Skype with certain classrooms they would follow my blog um, they were following the governor's school blogs and looking at all our pictures so that they were still experiencing it every day I missed in the classroom so that was really neat and then we also too wanted to say thank you we